Hi everybody, this is Sharon Ampus from Blackboard and welcome to this week's Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series. At the beginning of each of these series we just do a quick lay of the land. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our Blackboard Collaborate technology, um, so just very quickly, we have three panels. We have the audio video panel. Um, we've got the participant in session panel, so you can see the other participants in today's session as well as the moderators. And we've got a chat panel. Also, we have we are going to be doing some voting today, so it's just a, a quick refresher if you could. Um, select yes if you can hear me okay, and that way you know where to use the polling option. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And then lastly, you know, we use the chat uh, box for questions. If you do have a question, um, you know, we'll either interrupt Anna today and ask it, or we will um, ask it at the end of the session. So I'll be helping to moderate that. Um, but with any question that you do ask, if you could just put a queue uh, next to it so we can kind of differentiate between when something's an actual question and whether something's an actual comment. Uh, this is just a list of the upcoming webinars. Um, we have a couple of K-12 webinars over the next two weeks. And then we go back to higher ed on um, assessing or more about rubrics from Dr. Julia Vandermullen from Davenport University. And then we have a, another session on motivating and engaging your online students from Paul Bowden from Fitchburg State. And then uh, another one in May on organizing your content. So if you haven't signed up for those sessions, you can do so at blackboard.com slash bits. All right, so now I would like to introduce today's speaker, Anna Reese. She's an instructional designer from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University Worldwide. And she was also one of our 2012 exemplary course winners. Um, Anna has been working now at Embry-Riddle for about three years. She's an innovative and skilled online course designer who continually researches new techniques and strategies, inspiring faculty developers to create engaging courses. Uh, she's experienced in information technology, project management, and overall business process for engineering. So I'd like to welcome Anna today um, to hosting our session. And uh, before I pass it over to Anna, we did want to ask, uh, just got a sense of the lay of the land and who's on uh, today's call. So actually, let me just clear the polling window. And I will change the polling type um, to A through D. So if you could go to that same um, you know, polling option and just enter what your role is, we can just get a sense of who's here. Great. So what I'm actually going to then do is, <laughs> Kathy Zavell says all of the above. I love it. Um, I'm actually then going to push the polling uh, to the whiteboard so you can now see who else who is here. So we have mostly instructional designers, uh, some educators, um, some other, and a few people who didn't select anything. Um, so with that, Anna, I'm going to pass it over to you. Well, welcome everyone. Um, it's you know, they always say at the beginning of a presentation you should know who your audience is. So um, I'm seeing that the majority of people are instructional designers, just like me. So welcome. And um, I'm hoping today you'll pick up one little nugget as we're going along of some different way of using discussion boards, um, because I'm sure we've all you know just you know discussion boards are important in an online element, but it's like but how can we add some zest to these things? So, um, of course, with um, most of the courses I design are all online courses. So we don't have that luxury of that first class period getting to meet everybody. And so we always have a tradition in our courses and starting off with introductions. And so um, let's see here. Sharon, am I supposed to forward the slides or are you forwarding the slides? I'm sorry. It's up to you. It's on the top right corner. If you want to advance, it's a little arrow. OK, got it. Yeah. Um, And it's not, let me do that. Oh, here we go. Oh, I was on the wrong button. I'm not used to this collaborate. We use a different web conferencing tool. So thank you, Sharon. So, um, and so here's an example of how we do introductions in our discussion boards. Instead of the usual, um, just, you know, Ty tells who you are, where you're from, because um, we have people coming in from all over the world. So, you know, we can have people in 20 different time zones. 
Um, and so we kind of add a multimedia touch to ours. And we say, you know, you can use Animoto, you can use Voki, you can use Google presentations. We really don't care. Um, we actually encourage them to be a little innovative and experiment just a little bit. And then kind of show us their personality because it's a great way of showing some personality. And speaking of showing personality here, I'm going to do an app share showing you a Voki that I use sometimes when I've presented at another conference here. And give it some time to load here. And so again, we're working at Aeronautical University. And, and actually, if you guys can see the Voki screen, can I get a green check? Let's say I'm, I'm not getting too many green checks here. So, oh, here we go. Okay, now they're coming through. Okay, so now I'm going to, and you can see here we're at an Aeronautical University. So I got to pick, um, you know, a young-looking woman sitting in front of um, an airport, and here I can play the introduction. Hello, I'm Anna Reese, production coordinator from Embry Riddle Aeronautical University Worldwide. Is the world's oldest and largest fully and I won't bore you with that going on forever, but that kind of gives you an idea of how you can record things. And in fact, when I do this at conferences, what I love is that I don't have to worry about introducing myself. The Vokey does it for me, and I can sit here and kind of watch the audience and see how things are going. So let me stop the app share here. And there we are, back to the screen. Um, so, but another thing that we started doing in our introductions too is that we have started incorporating a lot of group activities in our assignments. And so another thing we'll put in here is we'll ask them maybe specific questions in the introduction that helps the instructor decide how am I going to assign everybody into groups? Because you're kind of you may be looking for somebody with different skill sets or personality traits or things like that. So we'll also do that in doing our introductions. Now here we've got um, Ken Witcher is, in fact, he was one of our outstanding instructors last year. And um, he uses Jing Video. And I know if any of you are, are familiar with Jing Video, know that that started to go away. But Ken actually has created a library of videos that he uses. And he posts them in his courses. And again, he's not having to recreate every time he goes in there. He's got his standard introductions and makes sure he covers the standard video. Now, um, in the TechSmith, I've even started a board on there. Please bring back the webcam capture. They haven't done it yet. But an alternative that I found is called Screencast-O-Matic. And so it'll also do the, the screen sharing and capturing the webcam. Um, and we also use Jing a lot to provide feedback to students. And, um, and so I'd like to know right now, going on to the next poll here, is how many of you have ever used in any of your discussion boards some kind of other Web 2.0 tool, like a Voki, a Jing, um, any, of the, yeah, any of those options? And if you've got some others, um, raise your hand, because I'd like to hear what everybody else is using. I'm seeing a lot of Collaborate people. I'm seeing some Jings. Those seem to be the two dominant ones that everybody's using. And then I've got some others. Um, and if you just want to add to the chat room, um, type in what you're using, and then maybe we can share those with everyone. Oh, I, oh VoiceThread. I love VoiceThread. Um, yeah, I've just seen that one in Cam Studio for YouTube. Um, in fact, I would really like for my instructors, that's one of our pushes for our CTLEs to do some voice um, thread. And that one I love because it's, you can kind of get some interaction going and just you know, talking to the same um, screens. Oh, Blackboard Video Everywhere. I haven't, yeah, I haven't had the opportunity. I cannot wait till we get the new um, Blackboard Collaborate and um, the interface that's coming with the new Blackboard upgrade. Okay, then. 
I keep getting the wrong button. Here we go. So back to the discussion boards because it gives you some alternatives. And we probably should start with some ground rules here. And these are some of the things that I tell my instructors that are teaching online when I'm working with them or we're designing classes. Um, and some of these you're probably going, oh, duh, these are pretty straightforward. But yeah, no yes, no questions because all anybody's going to do is answer yes or no. Multiple questions. Um, we found that if we load up the discussion board with two or three questions, um, it, the discussion kind of goes awry a little bit. It gets um, spread out too much and it kind of loses its focus. And so we, we really try to focus the question, especially in an online um, um, only class. And of course, none of us ever try to write a boring class. But then you're going, okay, well, how do I avoid being boring with this? And one of the things we do is we make sure we ask high-level questions and then we also follow up with probing um, questions as well. And some examples of some high-level questions would be, and what I love doing in online is I love doing controversial topics because you can get people, I think, are willing to discuss more in an online format versus in a face-to-face. -face. In fact, I, um, I get that feedback a lot. Um, I've been teaching some instructors on how to go blended, and they actually find out they're having better discussions in the online than they are in the face-to-face. And so I love doing um, controversial topics. I also like the hypothetical. And this kind of leads to why also online discussions are seem to be more effective than the face-to-face -face, is because you can give them a chance to dream and to think and ponder the idea. When you're in the classroom, you ask a question. And of course, you've always got in the front of the classroom the eager beaver that's going to jump in all the time and, you know, and jump up in front of everybody. Here you kind of get the opportunity for them, you know, for everybody to respond. And you give them a chance to think about what they're going to say versus whatever is the first thing that comes off the top of their head. And so I think that it you know, encourages more critical thinking. And then you can also you do, um, we like to, uh, another category uses evaluative. You know, what do you think would happen? Um, also compare and contrast, you know, type things. So there's all kinds of different ways that you can do that. Um, oh, another one here I've got here is predictive. What do you think is going to happen if we do X, Y, and Z? And so again, invoking those critical thinking skills and getting them to think about what could possibly happen. So because again, you're in a discussion board. You know, what could go wrong? Nothing. And it's a great way to throw out some scenarios and let them go through. And on the follow-up and probing questions, we actually had an international business course that we offered about a year ago, and it was actually international. We were able to collaborate with people in four different countries. And I remember there was an Argentinian, and I remember there were some European countries, and I can't remember, there were small ones, I can't remember exactly where they were. But the reason the, um, the Argentinian um, really stuck out in my mind is that he was highly engaged in the class. And so whenever the students were posting anything in the discussion board, he was in there in a split second answering it, and he was just totally on top of it. Now, we had the luxury here because it was our, our local students were also in the course, so I could talk to them on the side and say, okay, how, you know, how do you like this type of discussion when you know you're speaking to a non-English speaking in Argentina where English is their second language? And I said, for them, it was intimidating when the instructor was in there almost immediately. They, almost, they found it intimidating. Um, but then on the other hand, we went across the continent and then we went over to Brazil very laid back personality. And what he did is he hardly got into the conversations at all. And we actually had them take one discussion a week. So it was a great way to see different ways of managing discussions, but all in the same class. And the Brazilian was very laid back. And he didn't engage his students at all. And the, consequently, the discussion kind of faltered a little bit and didn't go anywhere. So you do need to get in there and ask some follow-up questions. Um, but the, and back to the Argentinian, what he did was that he purposely asked a leading question, didn't give him all the information he wanted to give him, let him go on for a couple of days. And then he came in and he says, oh, but what if you also knew this? And then the question would take a twist and a turn and go somewhere else. And so even though the student said it was intimidating that he was in there all the time, they did like how he added new twists and turns. And it got him engaged and into the discussion. And they were going in because they never knew when he was going to throw them another curve in the discussion. So that's another great way of just making the best of what you've got in your discussion boards already. So if there aren't any questions on that one, I'll keep moving along here. 
Um, now, and as Sharon mentioned, I did win um, some a couple of Blackboard Exemplary Course awards last year, and one of them was based upon um, a case advocacy um, discussion board activity that I designed for a PhD level course on um, the legal environment in aviation. And what we did with this discussion board when I was we were sitting down, I was with the subject matter expert and was working with him. And I said, okay, if you were teaching this class face to face, what would you do? And of course, there were going to be all kinds of discussions and debates going on in the classroom. And I said, okay, we want to try to mimic that in the online world. So of course, when you're in the legal environment, you have a plaintiff, a defendant, and a judge. And so what we decided to do with that activity was that we set up a discussion board that spread out over two weeks. And, um, and that's the thing I'm always telling my instructors too. Don't feel like, because you know, you have a, we usually have what we call module weeks, and they think that everything has to be done in that week. And um, the thing we have definitely found is that, especially in the online environment, especially when you're dealing with adult learners who have also got a professional career going on, you really need to leave time for them to be able to go through everything. So what we did is we set up week one and week two. And we would sign, and we broke them up into small groups of three, which you can do with the great um, group tools that you have in Blackboard. And we would set up a plaintiff and a defendant, and then we'd also assign a third person as the judge. And that was a student that was in the class. And for all you instructors that are out there, this is a great way to take some of that workload off of you. Because as we all know, when you're doing online discussions, you know, that's, that takes a lot of maintenance. It takes a lot of work to keep up with, especially if your students are actively involved in them. Well, this one, you get, as the instructor, you get to kind of stand back and watch it all happen and see how it evolves. And then you weigh in um, at the very end of it. So we would set up a plaintiff and a defendant. We'd give them a case that they were supposed to do it. And we would tell them that you were supposed to advocate one side or the other. And so by the end of the module week, the plaintiff and the defendant were supposed to write up a case brief and their argument and submit it to the judge. Not submit it on the discussion board yet, but just submit it to the judge. Because you can imagine if, you know, if one put their argument out there before the other one, then the other one could go out there and do more research and counter it more. So we said, okay, the judge is going to be the controller of the discussion board. You submit your arguments and your case brief to that. Then the next week, we knew the judge was going to post those arguments at the same time to the class. Now, there's nothing better than a bunch of PhD students in a legal environment and putting something up for argument. Um, there, was, there was no lack of engagement on there and people trying to shoot holes into everybody's argument. And so that's what happens the next week. And the judge is in there trying, you know, he's monitoring, he's making sure things don't get out of hand. Again, it's a student that's doing all this. Because again, we want to see how they're critically analyzing what's happening between the two people, you know, between the two arguments, and making sure everything stays civil and academic. So there, and what's also great is that the plaintiff and the defendant also have the opportunity to go back and rethink what they just put up there. They can strengthen their argument. They can add more material to it based upon what's going on. Then at the end of the week, the judge then makes a ruling in favor of the plaintiff or the defendant based upon what's going on in the discussion board. And um, it's, we've, we've probably ran this course now. It's getting ready to run its third time. Um, but, there's, but talk about getting lots of engagement and lots of activity on a discussion board. Um, it, it goes really, really well. And then at the end, what happens for the instructor when they step back in, who they're grading is the judge. And so they're grading how they managed it and how they kept everything on track. Um, we do provide the judge um, a, with a rubric, with their own rubric, that they use when they're judging the plaintiff and the defendant and they're giving them the grade. Now again, this is something that's done in a PhD level course where I know I've got highly engaged students. Could I possibly pull this off in an undergrad course when you don't always have everybody there? Um, I haven't tried it in under, undergrad. I would be, I would try it maybe in a very small scale and see how it went. But, um, but at a PhD level when I know I've got highly engaged students, um, this has gone incredibly well. Yeah, the other thing we found that works really well, because again, I'm, I'm designing mostly for um, K or adult learners, so I'm not, I'm not thinking about the K through 12. Um, but I always find that argument interesting too, like you know, they say adult learners want to know why, adult learners want options. Um, I haven't met a K through 12 student that didn't like to know why they were doing something and didn't like options too. 
But um, we will, though, in, um, in the English 222 course that I've um, helped write, we do give them options in the discussions. And so in, in most of our discussions in this course, um, we will wanted them to apply something they learned in the, it was a business communication course, and we wanted them to apply what they were learning. So we would give them options because maybe they were more familiar with, you know, doing something in this venue versus another one. Um, because again, we're an aeronautical university, so a lot of things has an aeronautical um, t twist to it. But we're finding that you know not everybody comes with a lot of aeronautical background to them. So sometimes we'll give them the options of okay, you can you know apply it to in your work environment that you're doing right now, or you can you know use the standard scenario that we use for our aviation scenarios. Um, the other thing we found that this helps us do is this course we had a lot of content we wanted to cover. So what we did is we said respond, write your initial response, which usually you know is a pretty healthy response. Um, I kind of consider it a one page response. But then um, your initial, but then when you wanted to respond to everybody else, you needed to go to the other thread. So they didn't have to write up a very thoughtful pro response for the second one, but they got to go read everybody else's. So what that did is that helped us expose them and to multiple content versus making them engaged with all of them. We were focusing on how do we get them exposure so they're familiar with the content. So that was another way of how we, instead of asking two or three questions, we said go answer this one, but then go respond and read the responses to this one. And so it gave them a way of getting some more options or getting more exposure. Now, the question here that we start asking ourselves a lot of times um, at the beginning is, is the discussion board really the correct tool for doing this? Um, because it, with my instructors, I do, you know, they say you can't do everything you do in the classroom in an online world. But I've gotten pretty good at trying to mimic it or twist it to kind of re represent what happens in the face-to-face -face environment. And often it comes back to what is the right tool. And so we've come up with this model here that we use when we're trying to decide, we start, I start asking my um, instructors, okay, what kind of discussion, what kind of communication is going on? Is this more of a one-to-one -one just between you and the, the student? Is it, you know, where you're wanting them to talk to everybody in the classroom and this is a many-to-many? -many? Or is it a one-to-many kind of conversation where, um, where we um, use this a lot as when we ask students to reflect and apply it to their own real life experience, um, you know, not they don't necessarily get a lot of feedback from it, but we want them to express that in the class, and so that is a, um, a representative of what a one-to-many type of discussion would look like. So let me show you a few examples of how we apply that. And the one-to-many I was just describing is blogs. And again, you can see here this is a reflection blog that we use in our leadership courses. And why I really like blogs is that it, it kind of it, it's a, a, a derivative of a experiential learning. Um, okay, we can't exactly experience the event in the classroom, but we what really helps materials stick with students is when we ask them to apply the concept to what they're experiencing right now in their own lives. And that's what we do in the reflection blogs. And they don't necessarily need somebody to respond to it, even though if they, they can respond to blogs and Blackboard. And you know, if they get somebody else that comes in and goes, oh, yeah, I had that exact same thing happen to me, or I know exactly what you mean, or we even had um, it happen where they come back and say, well, OK, you did this, but in my work environment, I found this was useful. But So we don't make it a requirement to respond to them, but we do want the student to sit down and think through and reflect on what the, in, in this particular case, there was a video that we had them watch, and then we wanted them to reflect and sit down and think about what they were really doing and just apply it to what, how, in their own work environment. And then an example of one-to-one -one is journals. And back to my English 222 business communication course, um, we wanted, the instructor really wanted the students to stretch their writing skills and also be able to express where they were struggling. Because we all know that 
the key to fixing any problem is you need to be able to properly identify it. Well, students don't want to do that in a public forum. They don't want to do it in a discussion board, and they definitely don't want to do it in a blog. But they're willing to do that in the one-to-one -one with instructors. So part of this business communication course, we designed journals in there, and we asked them to put in their areas that they really struggle with business communication. And so then the instructor could actually address them one-on-one, -on -one, and it wasn't in a, um, an e you could do that with email as well, but we actually forced them to do that each week, and we wanted them to reflect on what did you find the most difficult, and then also we want we asked them to also reflect on what they found the most beneficial. Again, another great way for you as an instructor to get feedback from the students versus just grading assignments all the time. And so we really like the journals uh, using that when we're wanting that type of communication to go on. And then a many to many, and you know, again, what I'm showing here are the Blackboard tools. I'm sure you all have lots of other um, Web 2.0 tools. For example, um, the um, VoiceThread I think is a great example of a um, a many to many type of communication tool. Um, but here we use the wikis. And back to my business communication course. Um, we had students in all different countries, and they were reusing the wiki there to compile their um, content into one area. And so people would go out there and you know do research, post articles, and then they could all collaborate on that together. Um, of course, discussion boards are another of a many-to-many -many kind of communication tool that's out there. But um, you know, again, we wanted to give them something that they could share more and just, you know, I love the idea of the blank page and everybody's writing on the blank page. Um, and also what we liked about in the wikis too is that you can actually see what the students are kind of working on. Um, you know, you in the discussion boards, you can kind of see discussions going on, but are you're wondering, okay, are they really getting any research done? Are they really making any progress on that? So here you can see it. Plus, with the wikis, when you make them graded, you can also be able to track students by how much they are engaging in the activity. Because as you know, in the online world, um, you have a hard time tracking how much, you know, do you have one person who's doing the lion's share of the work, you know, and you've got your stragglers. And so when you do a graded wiki in Blackboard, um, it, it helps you be able to monitor that and possibly try to motivate or even, you know, you know, motivate through grading, you know, to get them to engage more in the wikis. So and actually, I, I'm just seeing here that it's already 11.27, and I've, I've blown through this really quickly, because I'm used to doing this in a face-to-face -face where I get all kinds of questions. Um, Sharon, do we have any questions just yet? No, there weren't any specific questions, but if people do have questions, they can enter them in the chat. Um, there were some great um, just comments if you want to go through the chat window and perhaps read them out, um, and people can contribute to the conversation. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Well, I'm just going to start at the bottom and work my way up because you know that's how you do it in chats. Is what is your favorite Blackboard tool that never lets you down? Um, you know, cause there's always a bit of technology that's going to always let you down in some way. Um, you know, what's funny is lately I've really fallen in love with doing blogs, and because for me. I can follow the conversation better in a blog than I can in a discussion board threads because you get all those different branches going off. And a blog kind of gets everybody focused on whatever that initial posting was in the blog. So if you're someone that kind of struggles with the discussion boards and trying to keep track of all those threads, I, I'm really liking the blogs right now because it just makes it easier to read. Um, and then someone was saying, I bet you would have um, great success with undergrads. And yeah, we haven't had the chance to do that yet, but um, you know, we, we, I, I do want to try to do that and get some really good debates going on. Um, OK, and then Kathy says, could you please share more about how your instructors then provide feedback and assessing learners from these activities? Well, the one thing, especially in the, um, the DAV, the, the legal course, when we used the, the rubrics, and, and we just now upgraded to where we can have the interactive rubrics, before you know, we were using the same type of thing. It was spreadsheets, and then we broke it out, all the criteria. But now that we've got the interactive rubrics, we are loving that because we can show them specifically where we really liked what they were doing or we didn't like what they were doing. But another thing, and I kind of got away from this one, was the Jing. 
Um, with the Jing, we really, my instructors are really liking that they'll put the paper up that they're grading at the time, and they'll just talk to the paper, and then they'll send the link to the Jing video to the student. And so instead of sitting there trying to type out all their responses. And so they, you know, Jing is another great one of providing feedback. So I would say right now my two favorite ways are that I'm getting a lot of positive feedback is using interactive rubrics and getting detailed rubrics. And those, um, as we work with our instructors, um, those are evolving. And, but I love how they're evolving because as they use these interactive rubrics, they are, you know, they'll get students to come back and say, well, can you tell me more about this or exactly why in this area, which then gives us an indication that we need to add some more detail to the rubric, so we change that, and the next time we run it, it's even better. Oh, combining, okay, and Misty Cobb just thought of something. I didn't know about this one. Since the new inline grading tool for assignments combined video everywhere is one of my favorites. Now, Sharon, is that just something we haven't turned on here at Embry-Riddle, or is that just a matter of which release you're on? Yeah, video everywhere came out, uh, gosh, I think in December um, of 2012 as a building block. So um, I think you need to be on SB11 and above to, um, Service Pack 11 to be able to download that. Oh, it excellent. It's a great new feature. So yeah, I'm sure Embry-Riddle just hasn't turned it on yet. Right. Yeah, because everybody that I've, I've ever got them to go use you know, Jing to, to provide feedback, they, you know, the students love it, the instructors love it, and, um, and so, it, you know, again, you're back to getting back to being closer to with that face-to-face -face experience. Um, and I, I know for me anyway, I, you know, I'm, I'm one of those that talks to think, and so if I can give feedback in, a, in that one, that goes so much better. Um, let's see. Ah, uh, yes, okay, Margie here says, post first helps to get a diversity of opinions and fewer me too's. Yes, and I, I love structuring them or like um, if they have to come up with an original example in discussion boards, I love that one because if they have to come up with an example of whatever principle you're teaching at that point, that gets them in the discussion boards real quick because if it's at the end of it, then they've got to think harder and search longer to try to get um, to find ones there. So yeah, that's another really good way of getting um, them into discussion boards. Um, so there are a couple of questions that have come in, Anna. Okay. Um, could you describe what an interactive rubric is? Ah, okay. Interactive rubric is when you have um, a graded item in Blackboard, um, whether it's an assignment or a discussion board or a wiki, um, you can go into the tools, the course tools, and, um, and for us, anyway, because it came when we up, um, did an upgrade back in November, uh, rubrics is one of those. And well, before you always had rubrics in there, they weren't interactive rubrics. So it, just imagine a spreadsheet where you've got your criteria on the left of the spreadsheet, and then you've got your um, categories on how well they did in those um, criteria across the top. So you've got that spreadsheet. Um, so on the far left, when the ones we designed, and that there's various ways of doing it, we've got your excellent, or in Blackboard's terms, exemplary, and then you've got your above average and average, and you can change those any way you want. It's very versatile. You can put in any criteria, any um, categories that you want to in there. And then as instructors, all they have to do is when they go into the grade center and they're grading that activity, they can use that, they can click on the rubric for there, and they can sit there and look at each one of those criteria, and all they have to do is click, and they can, and it'll assign the points that you give to that, you know, if they get 10 points for doing an excellent job of, of a, um, a thesis statement, then you can give them the 10 points for that. And so all they have to do is click, but the thing that my instructors like the most is if there was one particular area that they did not do well, they can just click inside that box and they get an explanation box and they can put in there right there, I deducted a point for your thesis statement because of this, instead of typing it all at the bottom. And so the students are getting very detailed feedback and they know exactly where they went just versus, say, a standard comment at the end that you needed more detail in, you know, in your assignment. You can actually kind of break it down into that. Um, so it's already set up for it. The other thing that my instructors really love is um, when you click on it, it already comes 
pre-populated. When they did it in the spreadsheet, they had to type in the name of the student, type in the name of the activity, and then go in and you know click on the cells in the spreadsheet and then have it all added up. But when you do it inside of Blackboard, that you know it already populates the name of the student, the activity, and you've already got your criteria there, and you just click, 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 and if you have some more explanation, you can be specific. And I would say, I'm trying to think how much they, you know, I, I know they all say that it drastically cuts down the grading time um, because it's just it's so right there. And plus, too, for us, because we have adjunct professors who are online, and so we have a wide variety of adjunct professors, it's also helped standardize the feedback that we're getting to the students. So we, we have fallen in love with interactive rubrics. So that may explain it. Did I paint a good enough picture for everyone? Yes, I'll, I'll let everyone respond to that in the chat window. Um, but in the meantime, there's a couple of other questions. Uh, one from okay. Uh, what would you say is the most efficient way to engage students when they have to watch and assess a video? Oh, um, well, one, and we've been doing a lot of editing of videos lately, trying to get um, concise videos. Um, in the first place, like if someone hands me an hour-long video, um, I'm like, do you really need the whole hour, or um, you know, can we get can we get down to the meat of what you're wanting to to get there? So that's um, one way that we do it. Um, another is um, that um, oh, I just went blank. Is you have you need to ask pointed questions. Um, so if they if they watch a video, well, first of all, um, and this I always go to this in my churches, they want to post two or three videos, and then I'll ask them, that, okay, well, how am I going to know that they actually watch the video? And they're like, well, you know, and you, you you can see if they even clicked on the activity or not. But I'm like, no, 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 I need to know that they actually understand the material that was in there. So again, you'll try to design um, activities. That, in, that will tell you clearly that yeah they had to write the, to watch the video to get the answers whether it's in a discussion board or a reflection blog you know you can use any of these type of activities um, again it's, it's what you really want to to gain from that um, if it's one of those things where um, everybody's going to pretty much come up with the same answers um, because if they watch the video they're all going to have the same answers I would probably make that an assignment that just goes to the instructor because again if it's if, if everybody's supposed to be coming up with the same answer, a discussion board is not a good place to put that item because the first person that comes in there is going to have the answer, everybody's going to copy it and do the me too thing, and then you're done. So um, now, and so that's why a lot of times in discussion boards too, another principle we like to put in there is have the student apply the concept. So because everybody will apply the concept differently, um, or um, so. You, you do that, and again, back to the scenarios, and then I was just thinking of how do you get students in there quick, is if you do a predictive scenario, um, the first couple of people that get in there, it, it's pretty easy. You can, well, oh, yeah, I think this will happen. Oh, yeah, I'll think that will happen. But if you put the criteria in there that, you know, it has to be something unique, I don't want to hear the same thing, or I would do that too, or whatever, um, it gets your, your students in there real quick. Okay, uh, great. Um, so another question from Marcy that was asked earlier on. She says she teaches accounting classes where students will be doing about 10 hours a week in classwork. Um, she's finding it difficult to add discussions to their load. Do you have any tips? Uh, yeah, especially when they're doing all that. Yeah, because accounting is such a high load homework. Um, you know, but. Um, because, because I've, yeah, I've, I've got a couple of accounting classes I've worked on in the past, and I'm trying to think, how did we do those discussions? Um, because that's all, it, that and math classes are always. Now, math classes, I don't mind as much because I go, if it's a general math concept, I like to have the students go out and say, OK, find me an example where that math principle is being applied. Again, get them in there quick. You know, The first ones will come up with something real quick, and the others are going to have to go on a little bit larger search. On accounting, um, you know, you might want to do like a, maybe not a discussion, but maybe a reflection. Um, but then again, that's everybody seeing it. Is you know, why is this principle important? You know, why why do you have a credit and debit side to everything? Um, 
because um, to get them to reflect on why is that concept important and why they think you know they think it might be important moving to the future. So again, just thinking about you know getting them to apply or just to think you know answer the ask to answer the big question why. Because sometimes we need to answer the question why, but other times I think students need to answer the big why question. Because if they if they can if they can state why this is important, then they'll stick to it. I think mean, that's why students find things so. Um, Un unnecessary. It's like, because you'll hear the comment, oh, well, when am I ever going to use this, or why do I care about this? Um, and sometimes we don't need to give them the answer. Maybe they need to sit down and come up with the answer for that one. Okay, great. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Anna? Um, I think all the other questions were more about when, you know, when it posed first, when did it come out? Um, and inline grading and so forth. So I think Misty's been answering all of those questions in the yeah. chat window about when it came out with what building block, et cetera. Right. Yeah. And and I guess in a, you know, I was trying to you know what else to, to add to that um, because um you know we're in the week here we're going to be doing blackboard exemplary courses and I've had a chance to review um, a couple of years I've I've been a reviewer on courses. And and you know, and some of the stuff we you know it's just part of our standards here, and we don't think twice about it. But back to how do you get students in first? Um, you know, we always make it very very clear in our discussions what the expectations are. So you know, we'll tell them you know you need to post by midweek or our inter you know again back to that interactive rubric. If they haven't posted by midweek, you know the the, stu the instructors has to click you know the average or below average because they didn't meet that you know that criteria. So, um, so I think if find you know I think anybody that's taught online will understand that you almost have, you have to be so explicit in some ways in your instructions and then hold them accountable to it. Um, I always like grading tough the first week of a class because you know students are always trying to see how much can they get away with. And, but when you grade tough in the very first week, then they'll be the you know, students I think will you know step it up and meet your expectations in the, the following weeks. And then some of you have been sharing some great um, resources in the chat. So I see Caitlin Walsh um, shared a link to a, uh, a PDF file that kind of compares discussion boards versus uh, blogs. Um, so I don't know if people have had an opportunity to download that, but that looked like an interesting tool um, to look at. It compares blogs, wikis, and discussion boards. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, for sharing. Um, and then Quinta asked another question, what are a few key things to remember when designing an interactive course um, for adult learners? Um, for adult learners, it, and it, for us, we do um, kind of think of them as weekend warriors um, when, with a lot of ours. So back to the requirement of, okay, they need to be posted by midweek. Um, and especially in our PhD courses, we found that they do their lion's share of the work on the weekends. And so that's also why we've kind of allowed more time for discussions. Um, because say if, if your course starts on a Monday and they're all getting in on Saturday and Sunday, you know, you, there's not a whole lot of time for getting in there and being active. And so that's also another reason why we've um, spread these out over two weeks is to give it time for the um, the activity to develop, um, but and it's and the, and whether it's adult learners or you know young undergrads, um, which are also adult learners. But um, again, back to the being a very explicit and what you want to see, um, because the number one thing with my instructors as we because what we'll do is we'll design a course and then we'll let them teach it one time online. And they're still they're so used to being able to follow up with the student and say, well, no, I really wanted you to do this, or oh, well, yeah, nice try, but, and and that's and that's what we do a lot of times after the first teaching is we're catching all those buts, and so anything that you can think of um, that as you're teaching, you know, if you're getting ready to go online with the course, you know, make notes to yourself on what it, the information you found yourself going back and having to tell your students. Because in the online environment, you don't get, you know, depending on how long your term is, you may not get that chance to go back and say, oh, yeah, but. 
Um, so make sure that you try to capture as much detail as you can. Um, and you know, but I also tell my instructors, you know, you're in the course, you can, you know, redirect as you need to and make it more dynamic. Um, and to me, that's a, a kind of a balance you have to strike in the online world is, you know, allowing room for the class to be dynamic and go where you need it to go. But on the other hand, um, because you're online and you don't have the face-to-face -face communication as much, because we do, we do um, design ours to be strictly asynchronous, that you you know give them as much detail so they can take off and run and do what you want them to and you get the right product the first time around. Um, the other thing that we do a lot in our course is to say if you have um, a large assignment that's due instead of it just being a one-time turn in is that we'll have them have um, intermediate um, deliverables that they have to submit and and actually that's one place we do use the discussion boards for um, of course I'm working on right now is that the instructor purposely wanted everybody to put in the discussion boards these um, the small assignments that they're doing that are going to build up to the cumulative paper that they're going to do at the end and it's kind of you know it challenges everybody because when if they start looking oh wow they turned in 10 pages of stuff and I only have one page um, you know I'm, I'm gonna have to step it up here and so they do you know they start comparing and seeing what everybody else is doing um, and granted you have a problem with the plagiarism possibly but again that's how you know with us it's you know you tell everybody they have to have unique topics so that it kind of helps cut down on the plagiarism but we do use the discussion boards for everybody showing what they're doing because um, the research says you know the more that their work becomes public the more engaged they are in producing the best product um, if all they're doing is submitting an assignment to you and you're the only one that's ever going to see it and give it to a grade to it um, they're not as apt to engage in it as well. They're just going to be trying to figure out what the minimal effort is to get the grade that they want. Okay, great. Thanks, Anna. So another question came in from Gerald. Um, what types of questions have you found most productive with each of the interactive elements? Um, you mean like doing an interactive rubric or just, oh, a type of questions, whether you're using wikis, blogs, and um, journals, I bet. Um, yeah. yeah, again, blogs, we really like using them for reflective purposes. Um, how does it apply to you? And so um, that we use, you know, I would say, yeah, if you're, using, if you're thinking of them reflecting on it, the blogs is the, the perfect tool for that. Debates is in discussions. Oh, and also, um, just had a chance, if you guys are wanting to read up, let me find, um, I don't know if you've, um, any of you have read any of the work by um, Dr., I think it's Jing, it's J-O, J-E-O-U-N-G. I think he's done a lot of work lately on discussions. He's from Florida State, and he was just happened to be down here in Daytona Beach and had a chance to talk with him. Yes, his name is Dr. Allen. Jing, or I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's spelled J-E-O-N-G, and he has done a lot of work with discussions, and also um, another book I've, I've read recently that I really liked is by um, Bender, is the last name B-E-N-D-E-R, and it's discussion-based online teaching to enhance student learning. Um, and what one of the things I just found in that book recently was um, he actually had like a list of prompts in there, um, especially if you're like trying to figure out how to engage in your students and ask some follow-up questions. Um, so yeah, so look up Bender and um, discussions, and he had you know he had some really great examples in there recently of um, y you have some follow-up questions because I, I know especially with our um, online adjuncts, you know, a lot of times they're out there late at night trying to think of how, you know, they're, they're kind of gone brain dead. Ah, and somebody just posted the website for Dr. Alan Jing. And I want to say Jing, but I don't know. If, I'm sure that's not the proper way to pronounce it. Um, but it's been a fantastic gentleman and very knowledgeable when it comes to discussion boards. Um, in fact, he was just demonstrating for us just last week um, a different way of doing debates and how he manages the debates, which kind of reminded me, Sharon, of your technique of the cue in front of the question. Um, he's actually gone to a method of putting, when they respond to a thread, they, he has a prefix that he wants them to put in there, saying that is this a rebuttal, is this an expansion? Um, yeah, I, sh I should have brought my notes in here with me, but he has a great way, so again, so a better way of managing the discussion boards, and you can kind of see what kind of responses you're getting based upon the header that's on the discussion thread. 
So Latanya wants to know the name of the book again. I'll enter um, you by Dr. Bender. Bender. It is. Uh, I just had it here. Discussion-based online teaching to enhance student learning. Oh, thank you, Sharon. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, yeah, I, you could, yeah. Could you also demonstrate the point of it saying that you, when um, with online webinars, you need a producer and need somebody that's presenting? It, it, I, it meant, this is nice because typically I don't get to have somebody that's helping me in classes. Oh, and Missy Pazan has a companion teaching manual. Awesome. I'll have to go find that one. So Sharon, I know this is not really going for the whole hour here. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, and that's okay. Um, I think this has really been good discussion too, going back and forth and resources that people have been comparing. So Kathy Seville also posted a YouTube and video on Bender. Oh, okay. I know, and this is just a perfect example because I have high schoolers as well, and they're getting ready to ban all wireless devices in the school whatsoever. And um, but and this is what I would just love to challenge schools to say: it's like if you can, because all you have to do, especially in high schoolers, it, just ask them, hey, I want you to challenge. I want you to tell me something I don't know. And yeah, you know, they'd be sitting there googling away on their phones and trying to post resources. And then you, then you harvest it. You're like, oh, thanks, and you, know, and you grab it. So I, I love it when people are adding things, and that's what I love about online learning, um, or when you, when you allow um, technology to come into the classroom. So I don't really see any other um, people entering into the chat window at this point. So we can probably wrap up, unless anyone has any last-minute questions. Um, but Anna, I just want to thank you so much for you know sharing your ex experience with everyone. Um, this has been just fantastic, and um, you know really appreciate you taking the time to um, you know to share this with everyone. So at this point, if there's no other questions, um, you can see the uh, there's some comments in there for you, Anna. Kathy has said this is such a great session. She's going to send the recording to her faculty. Misty said she loved the session, great participation and sharing. So, well, thank um, you, thank you, thank you. Um, so we'll make sure that we um, send this out to everybody. They'll get, you know, as with all the bits webinars, you'll get a copy of the presentation as well as uh, the recording, which takes one or two days to send out. Um, Quinta, just to answer your question, yes, we have a webinar every week. Um, so if you go to blackboard.com slash bits, you can find the entire schedule, uh, the entire schedule there. I'm just going to enter it into the chat window quickly. Um, but we have different sessions that are broken down into three different tracks. So um, great. And then you know, be sure to pass that on to your colleagues as well. Oh, good. Somebody just jumped to the schedule. So Quinta, you can see the upcoming schedule for the next few weeks. So with that, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you so much, everybody, and. Uh, if you're going to join a future session, we'll see you again online in the future. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, everyone.